So here is a thing that's been bugging me the last week, and i got to talk to you, because you <laughs> seem to have infinite more knowledge of the DC Universe, especially. Yeah. Uh, so, The Flash. The Flash has suddenly become involved in my life for reasons that don't need to be elaborated on. But anyway, <laughs> been, uh, been watching and reading and learning a lot about The Flash. Uh, uh, mostly younger versions of The Flash, but anyway. Um, this, is my, this is my great critique of, of superhero comics, and I want to get your read on it. So the Flash is a speedster. He's got the speed force, which gives him the speed of speed with the speed force because he's a speedster in the speed force, right? Like that's right. That's the basic idea of the Flash. He's got some I don't I don't know semi mystical alternate reality speed force thing. I don't know what that is. I, it was a, it was a well in the Silver Age. It was a, a lightning bolt hit a, a bank of chemicals that spilled on him and turned him into the Flash. But I don't know how that taps him into the speed force. You know what's amazing is how hacky so many of those transformations are. It's always a lightning bolt, and it's always chemical. Yep. And it, it's either chemical, lightning, or radiation. Right, right, <laughs> right. Or having walked by a communist because it was the 50s, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm, I'm learning a lot about The Flash, never having read The Flash. But the, the, here's, here's my great critique. I was like, all right, Flash, I get it. You can run really fast. What kid doesn't like to run really fast? Right. So here are a list of all the other people in the, in the Flash universe that are also really fast. You have Zoom, Johnny Quick, Jesse Quick, Godspeed, Savitar, Reverse Flash, Reverse Pre-Reverse Flash, Flash, Flash Mrs. Flash. And you're like, what is, what is this? Mrs. Little, Flash? Now, now Does Mrs. Flash have a little bow in her hair, too, just to complete it? <laughs> What's funny about that is, is there a Mrs. Flash? No, Mrs. Flash apparently only happened during one episode of The Flash where he semi-dreamed that she became a speedster. I don't know, but Anyway, <laughs> my point is this, though, is that why does that feel so hacky when a, a superhero, when all of his villains... It's the same thing is true with, like, Iron Man. Like, Iron Man has to fight, what is it, like, Crimson... What's his name? Crimson, Crimson Dynamo. Dynamo and Iron Monger. And a, and and Titanium a whole bunch Man. of mecha villains, yes. Right. I mean, you get the idea. Like, Hulk has to fight... Uh, Abomination. Uh, the dude that's... Yep, yep, abomination. So why is it is it just the fact that we want likes with likes as our superhero supervillains, or is it hacky writing, or is this are they tapped into something that I'm missing out on here in in having likes fight likes? I don't get it either. I, and and I and I I have the same reaction. In other words, Shazam fights against Black Adam, and they're basic. They're they're both basically the same power set. Same thing with Green Lantern and Sinestro. I I I never liked that. It's like it, oh our pa- our powers cancel each other out. I'll have to best you in some other way. It's it's almost like saying it's like the writer is saying their superpowers aren't that important. They can still be super without their superpowers because the only way to defeat their arch nemesis is some other way. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, I see what you're saying. It it it's basically a writerly way of saying if you eliminate the thing that makes them quote unquote special then you'll see that the true thing that makes them special, Brad, was their heart on the whole time. They right? had it in them all along. Right, the magic. Like, to me, the more interesting fight scene, and again, not a Flash reader learning about Flash right now, but to me, the more interesting fight scene is Flash against a giant smart gorilla. Like, right. that's just so out of the box that you're like, what's happening? Yeah, that's fun. Now, now here's a, a tangent to that. Here's what I dislike even more than the perfectly matched superhero super nemesis. It's when uh, inevitably, and in, in, in this happens in Batman all the time, the villain is the opposite side of the same coin. I, I can't stand that. It's like, oh, we're really the same, you and I. <laughs> you know, like, like Robert De Niro sitting across from Al Pacino in Heat. And then basically that whole diner scene is them b- realizing that they're the same person after <laughs> all. Brad, we're not so different, you and I. Exactly, exactly. I just don't like that. <laughs> so, to sum up, comic books, pretty hacky. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 there's, there's a number of different tropes that, that are involved in there that I'm just tired of. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is, I guess this is also me being critical because we're looking back over, I don't know what now, 80 years of yes. American comic books, and you see the patterns. But the thing is, when you're writing it in year 10, like you're in 1940, and you've got Flash, and you're like, I don't know what to write for this week. How about Reverse Flash? That's fine. Yeah, Reverse Flash. That's great. <laughs> Oh, and, and if you really want to, if you really want to put it over the top in terms of hackiness, you find out that they're related by blood somewhere. 
you're my father, she's my mother, he's my brother, he's an uncle twice removed. Now you've now you've hit the trifecta. Yeah. The uh the 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 other flip of this coin that also drove me nuts. And this is another reason why I I I don't want to shit on the DC universe, but <laughs> I I never liked the whole Earth 1, Earth 2, Earth 29, Earth 746. Uh <laughs> Well, because also, who gets to decide which one is Earth One? That's exactly. Everybody, I, I always hated that. It's like you're so full of yourself that you've got to be Earth One, you know. And and what if the other guys had decided that they were Earth One before? Now they've just got to exactly. take exactly, a- exactly. Like what if you, if if Flash Earth One meets Flash from Earth Nine? He's like, I'm Earth One. He's like, bullshit. We have <laughs> constantly said we are Earth One. <laughs> We've been Earth One for and and I I particularly hated it Earth One and Earth Two because Earth Two predates Earth One. Earth Two <laughs> <laughs> was like was the all of the Silver Age uh, characters that that just you know get got reinvented. Uh, but they're but they're Silver Age. It's the old, uh, you know, the the Green Lantern with the cape and the red and green suit. It's Flash with the helmet with the wings on it. Those guys. Oh, Brad, wait. What we got? I, not to go back to Flash, but we got to stop and talk about this. How the hell did that hat stay on? <laughs> that, that that was nothing but catching wind. It was a, he was wearing a sail on his head. That thing was always going to sail off. You know when you go to a, a relative's house and they're like, oh, let's go sit out on the patio, and they crank up the umbrella that's like eight, six feet wide? That, that was the Flash's hat, the Silver Age Flash's hat. Yeah. He's running at you know, sub-light speeds, and he's running with a hat that's the size of a car. Oh. Yeah, that hat needed a chin strap in the worst way, but I think that's about the only way you could have made that costume worse. Was oh my god, the chin, chin strap. strap. That would have that snapped his neck in half, that chin strap. <laughs> I like, though, if in his origin story, they're like, Flash, you've been given the power of the Speed Force. Okay, I, I understand. He goes, also, you'll have an amazing ability to keep hats on your head. <laughs> oh, great. This is amazing. Because I have this beautiful World War I hat with some victory wings from, from Greece times on them. You this know what? I amazing. Actually, you probably haven't seen this, but if his he, once I saw it in one of the comics, he took his head off. And he's actually got like a three-inch peg uh, that grows out of his skull. And there's a little hole in the hat, and it just just fits right on that's how it stays on and the lego people are loving everything you're saying right now they're very excited <laughs> yeah, he's basically a lego <laughs> silver age flash you've been stuck in the speed force and i'm also a lego <laughs> it just gets better from here <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway well with enough of, of me uh pissing on reverse flash and flash and zoom and savitar let me uh, extend the warmest of welcomes to everyone and say hello and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. And I'm Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and director or co-director of Stripped. What am I doing? I'm claiming all the credit. <laughs> and this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Bradley, how are you doing this week? Oh, you know, it, this is this has been a tough month for me altogether. I've been I've been falling behind like crazy, uh, mainly getting the Kickstarter going and and getting that done. I, I've I've been a huge proponent of Backer Kit, and and they're so nice to me. Uh, and even with them, so what I did was I had them copy over all of the books and stuff from my previous campaign last year to this one. And even with that, getting that set up, uh, it's it just it's it's very labor intensive. I love it once it's set up because it's it's once it's set up, it does so many things and it saves you a bunch of time down the road. But I've been spending most of last week and a co- and and a good chunk of this week just setting that thing up, and it's and it and it's it's gotten the best of me, and I fall behind on everything else. So I, it's been one of those kind of months. Well, and it's sort of a hallmark of your personality and your success that I have seen you in recent years uh, organized and on track you are. And I know when you get even slightly off track, you're like, oh, it's all falling apart. It's all falling apart. Oh, oh and it, well, it, yeah, it kills me. <laughs> it kills me. I don't, I don't like being even a little bit off. And, and like I've, I've kind of made it a big point of, of like bragging that I put a lot of stuff into Patreon. And this month I haven't put as much Patreon content out as I typically do. And 
there isn't, I, I shouldn't say it in public because there isn't a single Patreon backer who's been upset. It's not like they're leaving in droves, but in my mind, that's what's going to happen tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, yeah, well, the day also, after I just, tomorrow. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me pause you as a friend. Instead of putting out 9,000 pieces of Patreon-exclusive content, you've sent out 8,999. 8, <laughs> so cool your jets over there, Mr. Self-Critical. Yeah, it, 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 my wife said the same thing. <laughs> she said, please, you're, you're, you're doing plenty. Just take it easy, you know? Yeah, give yourself, give yourself some credit. I, uh, and also, but, and, and because I've been uh, <clears throat> somewhat critical of Backer Kit in the past, I want to say, though, that uh, never having done the setup for it, I can assume that they uh, are no worse than like when I set up Shopify, for example, mm-hmm. for my store, it just takes forever to enter in all that data and all the weights and measurements and, yes. and shipping types and all that sort of stuff. See, it just takes forever. So you'd be familiar with it because that's basically how it goes. You have to put a weight in for everything and then you enter in shipping tables. And the neat thing is if once people add on books, to, uh, they get their Kickstarter survey and they get a little thing that says, as long as you're here, do you want to get an extra book? And you got a bunch of knock-on sales uh, from that. And then it just adds the weight and recalculates their shipping and, and, yep. and charges them the difference. Uh, but just say, So you've got to do two sets of shipping tables, one set assuming that they're starting from scratch and they don't have any books uh, because that's going to be your uh, pre-order store later on. And then one set of shipping tables that assumes a certain weight that you guess is is the average order and then adds a smaller amount on from there. It's It, it can get really confusing, and they're super helpful. I mean, I can't say a bad thing about them. But, uh, uh, but yeah, it, it, it gets you down, man. Yeah, it's a, it's not it's it's one of those moments where as a web cartoonist where or a cartoonist where you're like this is not what I signed up for. I'm doing a lot of math here. I feel like I'm in calculus 2 again sophomore year of college. Like I'm not what I want to be doing in life. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so that's I, I don't think that's unique to I never having seen the setup for BackerKit. I don't think that's unique to BackerKit because Shopify and frankly any online store that eventually automates things, it just requires a lot of data up front. Yeah. And there's no way they could automate that. I mean, you, you've you got to put it in. You've got to do the work. Yeah, they, the, the simple truth is you are the only one with all that data at first. So you've got you to be the one to put it all in uh, into the system. And it's just, it's a little bit soul crushing for a day or two. But then once it's done, like for me now, automated, the Shopify, unfortunately, sort of has me locked in because there's no way in hell I'm resetting all that up on a different yeah. store platform. You yeah, know? no kidding. And the nice thing. I know thing, there's a term for that once you're locked into a platform, but uh, I can't remember it at the moment. But anyway. Trapped. <laughs> Tra- trapped. <laughs> but, uh, but I got to say, it, it, even with all of that, like I wrote my, I, I've got a dedicated person that I've worked with now for two years at BackerKit, and I just dropped her an email saying, like, for example, I've got uh, 10, 12, 15 digital downloads that you can get through uh, either Kickstarter or BackerKit. And I didn't want to enter all those in again. And I just dropped her line. I said, hey, could you just copy those over to the new campaign? Boom. It was done. All I've got to do is enter the new books. So they're super nice. They're super great to work with. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to be happy when I'm past it and into June and try, you know, the kids will be off of school. You know, we could, the things that I, I'm just I'm just try, hanging on until the end of the school year. And, and then I think things are going to be better. Well, now, hold on. It gets easier for you when the kids are out of school in summer? My kids are older than your kids. Oh, yeah. My kids can, in fact, <laughs> I'm in the zone now where we've got a couple of like little home improvement uh, projects like painting the ceiling. We've got a porch that has like a, a roof over it and the ceiling is getting really, uh, you know, peeling and stuff like that. And I'm planning on setting him out there with a paint bucket and a brush and telling the, the, uh, 15 year old that you know that's going to be his job for the week is you know doing some painting and oh doing some God. stuff like that and and I'll just be in the house and supervise I'm looking into my future. Are you telling them I can give them painting jobs in 10 years? This yes. is amazing. Well, 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 you, well, listen, I haven't done it yet, so I'll let you know how that turns out. He might make a liar out of me, but I think he'll do it just – I mean, it's, it's, it's paint, and it's the kind of painting, Dave, that would kill you and me. It's ceiling painting where you'd have to be leaning backwards and stuff like that, and you and I do that, and we are in traction for the rest of the week. That little 15-year-old shit is going to go up there, slap, 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 get it all done, and it'll be great. 
There was nothing. There's nothing funnier to me than when all of a sudden the Midwest and you comes out. And you're like, ah, oh, I tell you what, that little Midwest shit. He's gonna do great. He's gonna do amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, though, that's more Philly Brad than, yeah, than, that's, than Michigan Brad. Philly Brad there, too. <laughs> I, got, I got my, my Brad's turned around. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, though. Like, uh, it's like that old saying, that old uh, medieval saying of, you know, when you want – when you want a painting job done right, hire a fifteen-year-old. Yes, that's, that's that old yes. that old saying. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to come out to that deck. You're going to come out to the, uh, that deck, and you're going to be enjoying a, a, a scotch, uh, looking up at the roof, going, "Oh God, what did I do by having him paint this?" <laughs> yeah, because well, I'll look, the ceiling will look great, but the amount of paint he gets on the floor and the walls and the front of the house is going to be another thing. The neighbor's cat is going to look like Pepe Le Pew with a stripe down his back. <laughs> the neighbor's cat's going to be chased by Pepe Le Pew down the street. <laughs> How inappropriate were those cartoons looking back? Oh, looking oh my back. God, there's nothing. Brad, listen, especially in the time of the Me Too era, you watch those old cartoons and you're like, oh, oh, OK, I see I, how. I get it. That's uh, that. <laughs> that was that was something that we put in front of kids to laugh at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see what we built. I see how this house has been constructed now when I watch Pepe Le Pew. You're like, oh, all right. We're laying the foundational b- blocks of just terrible, terrible people. Ooh, uh, but boy. anyway, I, the, uh, I went before. We're now 16 minutes in, and I got a big topic I want to talk to you about because you this wanna, has You me... want to talk about topics? We're doing so well. <laughs> 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 so listen, I uh, very rarely in my life have I made such a quick and complete 180 on a topic, and I want to I want to bring this up to you because I think you you a little bit share it with me, oh. and this is on the topic of Bonjoro, which we were semi fascinated with, but semi denigrating last week. Semi, and... we excoriated them last week. Let's... <laughs> I don't know if you did, but I ridiculed them last week. Let's be honest. <laughs> so, but and yet there was a tiny part of me, as you remember, I was having trouble signing up, and so I don't know why there was a tiny little voice in my head that said, "You got to try this, yeah. though." Like something about this thing about being able to directly address people seemed kind of magical to me, and I was like, "I'm going to sign up." And so I went back in, I signed up, and I did one or two of them. Yeah, and. Uh, I got to say up front, as a criticism, the, the user interface was not intuitive when I got in there. So that that's something they're definitely going to have to work on. Mm-hmm. But the core experience of being able to record a video and to send it to someone, I have rarely in my career gotten such immediate and generous and voluminous responses from readers as I have when I sent them bonjuros. Yeah. And I have come done a complete 180 on this platform, and now I have bought in big to this platform. <laughs> well, let's, let's take where, it from the top. Let's take it from the yeah, top. So, sure, sure. Am I getting ahead of myself? Yep. All right, go ahead. So we, we send out these bonjuros, right? And and if you remember from last episode, I was like, oh, my God, I look horrible in these. I, 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 I am not attractive on video. I don't sound good. These cannot be good. And then we we sent you sent out some. I think I sent out one, and I was over it. And you sent out a few for Comic Lab, and all of a sudden, like a two dollar backer after seeing the video became a ten dollar backer, and then another two dollar backer became a five. We saw people upping their pledges as a response to the video. Okay, and that was good. That was like, oh man, that's that's a really positive response to the message. And and we were thrilled to see that. Then we're workshopping this on the phone, you and I, right? Right. And we have let's talk about the call to action button. At the bottom, you can set a call to action button. So you can you can make that button say whatever you want it to say. I, I'm sure it's character limited, but within reason, you've got a few words to work there. And you put a link on it. And uh, Dave, you said uh, I think it was you know buy my book was the original iteration. And you sent me the video and we were workshopping it back and forth. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't like, this is all about friendliness. This is all about a personal touch. Buy my book uh, robs it of that. It makes it into a sales pitch. I don't like that. Right. And what we came up together was, wait a minute, discount. Here's, how much did you set the discount for? 
So uh, basically, I set it up at twenty percent, uh, yeah. and like in and gra- I mean, Brad's great advice as a, as a thank you, like thank you for supporting my work. If down the line you'd like to treat yourself to a Sheldon or a Drive book, here's twenty percent discount for me, and uh, and I'll take it from here for a second, Brad. Yeah. So that discount then translated into on that day or first couple days that I did it. Like six, seven hundred dollars in additional sales, and I was like, "Well, that just paid for Bonjuro, right?" Because Bonjour, one of our complaints was Bonjuro was twenty dollars a month, which ends up being you know a couple hundred dollars a year, and you paid for it in the first week. Yeah, and and by the way, not uh, it wasn't hard to do. That's the kicker: is that once this thing is automated, and it did take. I want to I want to preface this: it did take a minute for Brad and I to figure out how to set up the automation, right? But once it's in your phone, you literally stop what you're doing. You turn around at your drawing desk so that you have the drawing desk in the background so that people get a sense of you working at your studio. And you go, oh, my gosh, Susan, I just saw that you back Comic Lab. That's that's amazing because Brad and I are having so much fun with it, and you are directly uh, making it possible for us to hire an editor. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Boop. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, anyway, the responses that Brad and I got back, forget the monetary responses. The, the, the thing that I want to talk about is – the emotional response, because yes. this has a bigger long-term effect. I forwarded on to Brad a few emails that I got, and they were – Brad, how many paragraphs would you say they were? Some they of were on average between three and five. I mean it was more than, hey, thanks a lot. That's cool. And they were long paragraphs. They weren't like two-sentence paragraphs. They, 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 they were the kind of emails that you open it up on your phone and you know that you're going to be scrolling to read it. Right. It's that, that kind of volume. And here's the, here's the uh, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot by reading their emails, but you would you would open them up and you would go. First of all, the reaction was, "Oh my gosh, you said my name yes. like that," and I don't want to I don't want to make that sound like uh, too wide eyed. That was the core response of like a cartoonist that I've read for years just said my name and said hi to me. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah. And so I we're going to come back to that point, but yeah. anyway, the next thing was it was then five. It was like you've emo- opened the emotional floodgates because then they are sort of given permission to tell you over five paragraphs how much your work has meant to them, yeah. all the great times that you've either saved them from a dark spot or helped them in a moment of optimism or this or that. And and then at the end, it's like uh, most of them wrapped up by saying, oh, my gosh, I just treated myself to one of your books to say thank you in return or, oh, my gosh, I've just joined your Patreon to say thank you in return. And it's an amazing response because it's everything we've ever talked about, Brad, at Comic-Cons where you are making a personal interaction and and cementing your relationship as a cartoonist, not just the cartoon, but as a cartoonist yes. into your readers' lives. And in a non-creepy way, it's a really nice way to have a personal outreach to say, hey, thank you for reading. And I know you're not always going to be able to do it, but in this moment, thank you for being able to financially support the strip because that's how I make my living. Yeah. And uh, on the nicest ways possible, it was really quite a lovely exchange, I think. No, it was fantastic, and I'll, I'll I'll even go one better, and that is that's when that whole say my name thing. That's when I turned uh, towards Bonjuro. I, I turned away from being anti Bonjuro. Uh, that guy who I had made a little bit of fun of in the last episode sent me a personal. Hey, Brad, and, and he's from Australia, right? He's standing in this gorgeous park. He's standing outside. Uh, He goes, hey, Brad, I just want to thank you for joining Bonjuro. And if you have any questions, blah, blah, blah. And it's I got to tell you, you you owe it to yourself to experience this. Uh, The 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 power of hearing your name being said uh, in no small way. It's a huge psychological uh, impact. And and in that moment, I'll be completely honest with you because I have no problems telling on myself. I felt important. I felt special. And I felt significant. I felt like I was a big wheel. I must be really important to Bonjuro if they're they got this guy who's out there in a park and he's taken five minutes to send me a video and he's and it's clearly just to me. It, you you feel like a big shot. You feel important, you know. And I when I felt that emotion way uh, you know sweep over me, I knew that Bonjuro was onto something huge. Right. And uh, so here's where I want to I want to put a pause in a conversation and talk about in 1936, Dale Carnegie wrote a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it's one of the most uh, best selling books uh, in terms of salesmanship and, 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 and the like in that genre. 
It's it's a, sort of a groundbreaking work in that regard. And uh, I always found it a little schmaltzy. It's not really for me. I'm not a salesman, but I did read it once in passing many decades ago. But one of the core ideas that Dale Carnegie has was there is power in remembering somebody's name. And I and one of the reasons why I never took that to heart was because I'm terrible at remembering people's names. You can introduce yourself at a party and I forget it 30 seconds later. Exactly. Right? You know, like, exactly. I, don't, I don't remember it. But – um, what and the way I think it's either he or somebody else illustrates this point by saying, "Okay, you're at a party. It's a crowded room. You hear a lot of conversation around you. <laughs> you know, tons of people are talking around you. And then suddenly, three conversations over from the one that you're talking, you hear somebody say very sotto voce, Brad. Right? You just hear yeah, your voice. Yeah. And your brain has the ability to to weed out your vo- your name being said three conversations over in a crowded room. So your brain is processing all that background noise and, in fact, is actively looking for self-identifiers like Brad because we are social creatures, you know? Right. So when, uh, when I think part of the power of these bonjouros is when you – Reach out to somebody in a very personal video, and you don't get weird. You just say a heartfelt, hey, thank you. I really appreciate you reading. I really appreciate your support, Stephen. You know, or, hey, Stephen, thanks for, for reading my work. I appreciate that. There is power in being able to say and identify someone's name as an as a individual. Yeah. And it's not creepy. Like, we've all gotten the email, like, Brad, you bought a bowl from Pottery Barn. And then, right. hey, Brad, we saw that you bought a bowl at Pottery <laughs> Barn, Brad. And we're sending you this email, Brad, that yes. clearly has an insert feature, Brad, in the algorithm, Brad. <laughs> like, it's not that. It's just – it's it's a it, – in, in an automated world, it's a human outreach. And there's something – as Brad and I discovered this past week, there's something really special about being able to send a quick video that just says – Hey Margaret, thank you for for reading Drive. That I, that means a lot to me. I mean, that's why I make it. So thank you so much for reading, and thank you for the support, and have a great week. You yeah, know, that kind of thing. yeah. Okay, so I got to ask you this: How many times do you? How many takes does it take for you to do a video? Well, I I got pretty good at doing these. I, you, the, you know, it's the, the standard thirteen year old. You you face a light. You face a natural light source. You have something interesting in your background. You hold the phone slightly higher than eye level so that you're looking up rather than looking down. All the you know, how, hold the phone out as far as possible so that you have maximum exposure of yourself. I got pretty good at all the standard uh, selfie things that a thirteen year old would do, but. Um, on an average one, I probably takes me two times to get it right. Uh, I think, um, oh, it, it, I'll let you know when I'm under two dozen times. I, I, the one I recorded this morning, I swear to God. And, and okay. So Bonjuro lets you, uh, record it on your desktop. And I'm like, Oh good. I am so much more comfortable. Like that's how I did all the web comics, confidential video casts. I, I just set it up on my desktop. I feel comfortable there. Great. Uh, but the desktop interface is not very good. And if you do more than one or two takes, the video starts to lag. So then like the, 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 your mouth doesn't sync up with the audio track on the video and it's just no good. So it, it took me about three dozen, <laughs> and I'm not joking, about three dozen times <laughs> for me to do it, that, uh, do, do the one that I did today. But I, but I, 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 can, I, I, I do know that the more you do it, the more you'll get better at it. But all of which to say, don't get uh, disheartened <laughs> if, you're not, if your first few takes aren't, you know, just aren't that good. You'll get right. better at this over time. Right. And uh, I would pay a very large sum of money to see those 12 takes. Oh I would, God. I would, uh, <laughs> well, that would the, be delightful to me. There's one, I did a perfect take. I mean, a per, and of course I took my glasses off cause I'm vain. Right. So I've, <laughs> I did a perfect, uh, the, the perfect inflections. I smiled like you're supposed to smile. I did the little wave at the beginning because when they send the, uh, the, the video to the person that's getting it, they get a little GIF animation of the first few frames. And uh, Dave, you told me this, that uh, if you wave in that, that that's very attention getting. So I smiled. I tried not to, you know, look droopy eyed and, and, you know, I, I opened my eyes. I smiled. I waved. I did all the things you're supposed to do. I recorded the perfect take, hit the stop button. And I saw the little timer go zero one, zero two, zero three. <laughs> I, I missed I missed the start button. <laughs> oh my god. That's a delightful moment, Grandpa. Good job. 
And then I did one that was very good and I was ready to settle on it. And I, my, my thumb missed the stop button. And then you, and so here's my note to Bonjuro. I want editing at some point very soon because I did a perfect video and then I missed the stop button. And then I did that thing where you put the phone up close to your face so you can see what's going on and then hit the <laughs> stop button again. So then you've got a beautiful video and then all of a sudden it zooms in on my nose. <laughs> Oh my God! This is delightful. I, I, I want to watch that. Watch the Abbott Costello version of Brad trying to record a video. Hop, 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 hop. Abbott, I'm having trouble with my phone over here, Abbott. Oh, and and it's tough if you're like I, I, I if you're like uh, like like the stereotypical Italian speaker, and I've got my my Italian genes are coming out uh, because I talk with my hands, right? You can't do that recording a video with your phone. My phone's jumping all over the place because I'm gesturing while I'm holding the va- – I'm, I'm te- what I'm trying to say here, Dave, is I'm not good at this, and I'm trying to get better. Well, okay, that's good, uh, but I also want to uh, want to talk you off the ledge a bit in the sense that if you are sincere in the video, Brad, no one's going to critique you on your technique, you know? Perhaps, Like, if you yeah. just tell them that it means the world to them that you're reading the comic, they're not going to be like, I hear that, Brad, but your lighting and your, <laughs> your camera work just needed a lot of, a lot of improvement there. Yeah, and it, well, and as soon as I stutter or as soon as I misspeak a word, uh, then, you know, that's a, that's a done take. I got to start over. You know, no, I, don't. People, I, I will, I will, I will tell you this in love. People, uh, people appreciate those little verbal ticks and stutters that you have or I have. That's what makes us us. So don't, don't be too self critical. Um, but again, this is new virgin territory for cartoonists that sit behind their desk to do a video. So I get it that, that you're yeah. like, I want to get this right. Yeah, uh, that's that's a fair response. So now let, let me ask you this: you you took you you went full bore on this Bonjuro stuff. Tell tell these people listening how many different automations you've got set up. And each automation, like I paired Bonjuro with the Comic Lab Patreon. That's one automation. How many do you have? So, okay. So, for example, just to give people a context. So, you're listening to Comic Lab right now, and you go home tonight, and you're like, you know what? I'd like to kick the guys a few dollars so that they can pay for an editor. Um, and so, you sign up for Comic Lab. And what happens is Patreon uh, has an integration with Bonjuro so that when you sign up, Bonjuro pings our comic lab account not yours but our comic lab account and says oh we see you got a new backer and the, here's their email and so we set up an automated bonjuro for you to send to them and so you just hit boop and you record a quick thing and then bonjuro takes your email and sends it to you right that's how that's how the automation works yeah so i've set one up and brad has set one up for comic lab and then i have one for drive which is a separate patreon account of mine i have one for sheldon which is a separate patreon account of mine I have one for Shopify because they have their a special automation integration with Shopify. So that's my store. I have one for MailChimp. So anytime somebody signs up for Sheldon or Drive to be uh, delivered to their email, um, it gets sent to them for that. And then I have two more automations that I've set up with uh, Zapier. One for any time someone buys an original art on my website because that's a different buying process. Mm-hmm. And then one for any time someone buys an eBay piece of original art. So I have seven automations set up in the first five days of using Bonjuro, Brad. I went, I went whole hog on this thing. Yeah, and you can pair this with Shopify, WooCommerce, Slack, Mailchimp, Stripe, uh, and obviously Patreon, and a whole bunch others. I mean, and they're they're really building this thing out. Yeah, and I want to say, you know, we should have led with this. We're getting no remuneration from Bonjuro on this. It's no. not like they're giving us some discount or it's, it's going to or, – or they gave us some money to do this. It's just that we have gone – or at least me, I'm Brad too, but I have gone whole hog on this thing. And I have, I have been excited about Bonjuro this week. The last time I got this excited was when Kickstarter came around yeah. and when Patreon came around. Yep. The, honest to God, this is I, I, I did get excited when Twitter came around and I did get excited when Instagram came around. But here's the thing. Twitter and Instagram, at least for me, I have no way of monetizing those. They're fantastic for reaching out to readers. They're fantastic for into, to, into talking with the world. But Kickstarter can make my living for me. Patreon can make my living for me. And honest to God, Bonjuro can help make my living for me. Yeah. And that's how excited I've gotten for this damn thing. And that's why we wanted to talk about it on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Now, real quick, before we put a capstone on this, yeah. let's talk about potential downsides. Because if you've got crippling anxiety or, or <laughs> social anxiety or do not want to have your face out in any way due to shyness or insecurity, Bonjour, oh my God, that's going to be a huge roadblock. And this is not the app for you. And we talked about two episodes ago about 
uh, when fans get a little bit too attached. We talked about creepy fans, right? Yeah, and frankly, uh, Brad, I think in fairness to uh, 50% of the world, we should say that it's probably a very different thing when us as two old married dudes send out a bonjouro yep. than any female cartoonist we know sends out a bonjouro. Yep. The potential for dudes to read that the wrong way mm-hmm. and to get weird signals from that is 100% possible. Yeah, and and in fact, uh, it's so spitballing that I would almost wonder if Bonjuro at some point wouldn't give you the possibility of speaking through an avatar, like almost like a sock puppet, <laughs> you know, Maybe. where where Maybe. where you put a, an animation up there that uh, that that is timed to the vocal, and you know, so you don't have to put your face on it for people like we're talking about. Maybe, but I think I think the power of this these Bonjuro things is that. A, they are imperfect. Yeah. You're clearly just a person holding up your phone. B, it really is personal. Like, it's just me in a hoodie sweatshirt standing at my drawing desk going, hey, Stephen, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, because so many of my emails back said it really, like, uh, so all the readers that I've met at Comic-Cons or New York Comic-Con or Emerald City Comic-Con, they know what I look like. But for a reader in Australia or Germany or Kansas or northern Canada, all of which I've gotten emails from this week from Bonjuros, they'd be like, I never imagined what you look like before. And it was really fun to see what your face and and you're just a normal person and you're just sending me a video and this is amazing. Yeah. So I think the avatar loses some of its force, you know, that idea. No, I think you're right. But do I think that like, say uh, female friends of ours that would send up on juros would get creepers. Oh my God. I absolutely think that's possible. Yes. So um, that's a real consideration and it's, it's unfortunate, but um, I think that's a downside to, to this platform. Um, do, do you and I have the potential to get creepers? Absolutely. Do I think that anyone uh, wants to be creepy on old beat up 43 year old me? No, probably not. Um, but maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm somebody's slice of cake. I don't know. But uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm somebody. If you say maybe I'm somebody's slice of cake, I don't think you're going to have any creepers. I, I, <laughs> I think I think you've eliminated the entire crowd. That's like me walking into a party going, well, 23 skidoo. And people are like, yep, nope. I, zero I, I zero sexualized I'm... interest in that person. Nope. <laughs> no. I, you had, I, I had the whole daddy thing going right up until piece of cake or slice of cake. <laughs> oh, sorry about uh, that, ma'am. Uh, Dave, I hate to interrupt you, but I, I just noticed we just got a new backer on Comic Lab. Oh, my God. Uh, Brad, should I record a bonjour on uh, on air to, to, to show people what this is like? You read my mind. That, that This would be and, – and I want to hear people hear you do it because you have gotten you, – you, well, with seven different automations, you had a lot of practice. But you've gotten really good at it. So let's hear what it sounds like. <laughs> you know what my immediate thought is? Oh, I wish my hair was better and I wish I wasn't wearing this T-shirt. <laughs> Now you just got done telling me it's not about that. It's they they appreciate the genuineness. So so you know what? This will be fun for this person because they'll literally hear their bonjoro on air, yeah. and then they can maybe share it on Patreon if they want. And I want to hear if you can do it in one take. Okay, so I've logged in. I've, I'm going to hit the button, and here we go. So, hey Tiffany, it's Dave Kellett over at Comic Lab, and you are literally on the show right now. That is the microphone. This is the terrible closet that I record from. So here you go. Look at that. Look at the majesty of a man in a closet. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I wanted to say thank you, a heartfelt thank you from Brad and I, because you are literally making the show possible. Uh, as you know, we have now hired an outside editor, and your direct support is literally making that possible. Uh, it's not like Brad's going to pay for it. Let me tell you that right now. Uh, so, <laughs> so thank you for backing the show. Thank you for uh, listening. It means the world to Brad and I. And uh, congratulations on Enoch being awesome, basically. All right, and that's it. And then uh, it plays back for you, and you write a little message that just uh, says... uh, Now, you'd let that go even though you stumbled over congratulations on being awesome? Brad, it's not a perfect world. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. I was just needling you. (laughs) No, this is is an important point. Like, also, you can't let this get in the way of your workflow. It's a quick thank you. It's it's like... uh, can, uh, almost consider yourself when you're in a grocery checkout aisle. Do you do you say to the to the grocer after he's bagged your food? You know what? I didn't like the way I said thank you for bagging my food. Let me re- let me take that over again. Well, you may not. <laughs> Cut through the line ten people deep. Hold on, let me try this again. I I appreciated that you put the eggs on top. No, nope, no, hold on, let me try that again. Hi, I'm Brad Geiger, and I wanted to say thank you for bagging my food. 
Um, uh, no, anyway. actually, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say anything. I would just go out to the car and then bang my head on the steering wheel ten times, playing that moment over and over and over as I ridicule myself. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the self hate. I, I know it well, Brad. Good job. Um, so, uh, Tiffany, I'm going to say this, having just recorded this bunch over to you, even though I look like crap, uh, it would be fun for people to see the uh, me recording that in the in the closet. So if you want to share that over on Patreon.com slash Comic Lab, I think Brad and I would both love it. Uh, if you wanted to uh, share that video, you can send it to us, and we'll put it up on uh, on Patreon, okay? Um, anyway, that's the process. And yeah. are there downsides? Absolutely. Uh, am I super excited about it? Oh, my God. More than I have been for a lot of new platforms in a while. Uh, 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 yeah, this feels very game changey to me this uh, you and you were right in putting it on the level of kickstarter and patreon this is a game changer i think because we've gotten huge response and it's only been like a couple weeks well and oh i forgot to tell you this i was recording one in my studio the other day i, I turned around i had the camera facing me at the drawing desk and i was two-thirds of the way done and my wife walks in and she goes what are you doing and i said oh i'm recording this for uh, jessica and she goes who's who wait who's jessica <laughs> and, and i go oh she's a she's a backer of of of, uh, of comic lab and my wife goes wait what is this this is fascinating and i said yeah it's a new platform you can you can say an immediate thank you and she goes i gotta tell you I feel like you and Brad are figuring out like cutting edge stuff that I'm going to be doing in three years as a TV showrunner. And wow. I was like, ah, oh, you know what? That's great to hear. She's like, I, I honestly, I feel like you guys in, in web comics are doing things that artists in other fields are going to be doing down the line. Yeah. And I was like, that's sort of uh, heartwarming to think that we are figuring out uh, new platforms, new ways of making a living as an artist. Because for her, you know, it used to be that you would let the TV network do all the heavy lifting or you'd let whatever their PR teams do all the heavy lifting. But more and more showrunners and writers and actors themselves are reaching out directly to their fans. And so she very much takes a page and we will have her on the show to talk about it, but she takes a page from what we're doing a lot. And uh, it's fun to see. Yeah. Well, that's good. Tell her I said thank you. That makes me feel very good. Good, yeah. And now, and and she wanted me to tell you to do it in six takes, six takes, not twelve. So, uh... <laughs> twelve. Let's her try thirty six this morning. Holy cats! <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to our next topic. We actually have an audio question this week, Brad. Do you mind if I play that for the good folks at home? Oh, thank God, you've got it. I was, I was, as you were talking about Gloria, I was scrambling to upload it to the Comic Club folder. So go ahead, let her rip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Brad and Dave, hello. It's K.R. Hinton, uh, creator of Zero Lux, here again. So I've gotten some feedback recently on my comic that perhaps the story is in parts a little hard to follow. Maybe characters' motivations are a little unclear. I wanted to know what you guys' advice was on ensuring that uh, a long-form comic has clarity and that it's, that it's easy to follow in terms of the writing and I suppose the art as well. Thank you. That's a great question. And and That's it's really something that I think a lot of us hey, – listen, let me tell you this. If you're not struggling with this, you should be. In other words, there's a lot of people that are like, nah, people can follow my story, and I'm telling you, that's the person who's writing a story that's unfollowable. Either either you're a little bit worried about this or you're you're probably screwing it up. Would you say that's fair to say? Yeah, it's the kind of thing that uh, yeah. What's that old phrase that if you're not the one that's worrying about it, then that's the sure sign that you are the one that should be worrying about it. There's yep. a phrase like that, and yep, Baruni. It, I'm sure it's more uh, gracefully worded, but you're right in there in the zone. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> this is them. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so clearly, I'm the one that should be worried about it. Is what we're saying. Um, so uh, this is something that I worry about all the time because yeah. it is a fine dance, especially in long form storyline telling that you it's a dance that you don't want to reveal too much because then you're literally treating your reader like an idiot and uh, saying now in the plot line, we're going to go over here and do this thing. And it's important because of ABC. Like you don't want that. But at right. the same time, if you have, if you're being like, oh, I'm so mysterious and people are going, I literally don't know what the hell's going on right now. That's too far on the other extreme. Yeah. So uh, dancing that line, and we talked about this on an earlier show, but one of the reasons why I like writing long form in semi-real time is that without being reactive, I can take the input as one additional stimulus, the input of, of readers reacting in comments and in emails. I can take that as one additional stimulus to my overall writing, and I can react accordingly as my own editorial eye instructs me. Yeah. And by that, I mean... I'm not letting readers say, hey, I didn't understand what happened in these last panels. 
I take that in as input saying, okay, this guy's an idiot because I made that very clear. And so I'm not going to listen to that one. But if 40 people email me and say, hey, I don't get what's going on here, and I really love the story, and I, I love what you're doing, but I really don't get it. Well, then, as a, as a writer... I, I put on my editor hat and say, okay, sometime in the next couple of pages, you have to you have to weave in why that was the way it was, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, yeah, okay, so look, give me your strategies for how you do it on Evil Inc. So as a run-up to that, I will tell you this. Uh, I, I err on the side of being too explanatory and it, because I know I know my own personal filter, my own personal bias – in other words, I know what's going on, and so I assume everybody else does too. And to compensate for that bias, I've sometimes I'll do some things in the strip where I think it's hitting them over the head, obvious. But I've got to do that a little bit because, to compensate for my bias because I know I can't judge it perfectly and because I, I already know all the answers, right? So right. I would say for a writer – to err on the side of being a little bit too explanatory uh, and not w- without being, you know, ridiculous. But, but, but I would err on that side every now and again when you're, when you're deciding, ah, should I put this extra sentence in that says, uh, you know, well, of course I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing this because uh, my wife doesn't know where I am today. Uh, that every now and again, that's healthy because it compensates for your own bias. And one of my favorite ways of doing this is to bring in a visitor, right? So if you're doing a hospital drama, uh, the perfect way to do this is to bring in uh, an in, a new intern or a new nurse or a new doctor. And one of the seasoned members of your cast takes them on a tour of the facility. And they, they, you know, here's where we do this. Here's where we do this. There's Dr. Johnson. He's, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's a vampire. And there's Nurse Goodlittle, and, you know, she just came in from Transylvania. She's a monster hunter, whatever. And you're revealing all of this stuff to this visitor and what you're really doing in that. And and you don't have to take a lot of time with it. If you're a good editor, you can get right down to the the brass tacks. Uh, This visitor is a stand-in for either new readers or readers that have come recently or just if you're transitioning between stories, it's a good way to catch everybody up. Right, right. And and in fact, stepping back even further, Brad. First of all, Brad's point is absolutely true. Uh, the the new visitor or the naive, wide eyed newcomer, yeah, um, they are great for catching people up on exposition or re explaining things that have already been explained. But in a way, you want to. It, it's not like journalism where you're gonna you're gonna tell them what you're gonna tell them. You tell them, and then you told them what you told them. Uh, right. You know, like that's that's a version of journalism. Writing is not that way, and in some cases. The the single key sentence in an entire work is the only time you say that single key sentence. So mm-hmm. it's very different from journalism in that regard. Like you can have one line in Catcher in the Rye that reveals everything about the book, but J.D. Salinger only wrote it once. You know, yeah. he's not going to tell you, here's what I'm t- going to tell you. Here's what I'm telling you. That's why I told you what I'm going to tell you. You know, like, you know like he's not going to do it like a journalist would. He, he's going to do it in an artistic way. But so the naive newcomer in a story is great. It's helpful. It's also the interaction with the stranger. That's also a helpful one. Um, But also one of the reasons why the hero's journey works so well as a story is if you step back and look at it, the hero of the hero's journey usually starts at a semi-young age, and usually they are the wide-eyed newcomer to the wider Mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say, Brad? Yes. So as they start to, like if you look at, I'm trying to think of a hero's journey. If you look at Luke Skywalker, his introduction to the wider world is our exposition. That's our pipe coming in. And so his wide-eyed, naive view is like, oh, there's an empire. Oh, oh, there's the force. Oh, all this stuff. Oh, my. Oh, boy. <laughs> right? And that's sort of every hero's journey ever ever done is that via the hero, via the person we're following, we're slowly being unra- unrolling the exposition of this world. And so once you've gotten past that point, Brad's uh, technique of bringing in some other third party wide eyed naive uh, newcomer is a great way of of playing that same hand you know mm-hmm. so that's great and then uh one of the thing that I do with drive um and I wouldn't recommend this for every story, but I found it really fun the way the Victorians used to do it in their novels is that in the midst of 
um, story, I will suddenly have found objects like a half of a letter or a torn out page of an encyclopedia or this or that. And what that does is that without getting too boring with just pages and pages of exposition explaining things, um, this found object can do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of explaining the background and stories and the meanings of certain actions or events or items. And mm -hmm. uh, I always love that in Victorian novels when there was a, just a, an epistolary uh, little letter or, or something that was buried in in the middle of a novel because it was sort of a fun way to pull you into that world. So I used that in Drive a lot, and that's not for everybody. But um, uh, I'm trying to think of other ways that I keep the story on track without being high-handed. Uh, well, let, let, why don't I let you talk for a little bit, Brad? You go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, why don't you let me talk for a little no. <laughs> Suddenly we become an old married couple. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let me tell this story, Ethel. Uh, it, there's a couple other things I want to throw in there, and that is this. You also, since you're a webcomic, so you can have a special page on your site that is this, you know, the story so far, or, you know, the, the uh, ever popular about page where you just take and and please don't give me paragraphs and paragraphs of text you're a cartoonist either make this a comic or it, pair that text with lots and lots of illustrations and 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 break it up nobody wants to go to an about page or a the the story this far page and see banks and banks of gray type uh, so be smart about that but you've also got that where you can you can uh, bring newcomers in with an about page or a story so far synopsis, uh, which is I think very useful. Yeah, and, and so uh, I've also while you were chatting, Brad, I, I thought of a different way to look at this, which is if if readers are finding, let's just say, uh, part A of your story confusing, look at it from their point of view and ask yourself. If you were not you, if, as Brad said, you didn't have a peek behind the curtain as to what was going to happen, what's happened in the past, all, all the sort of um, background stuff that a storyteller knows, if you didn't know all that, how would you expect them to know about part A of your story from what you've written? And I... was it a fair assumption on your part to assume that they would be able to figure it out? Um, and as you write more and more, that will become more intuitive. Uh, so you'll know it in your heart, like, I'm giving them too much here, or I'm not giving them enough. And part of that is just more writing. And the more writing you do, you, the better you'll get at the intuitiveness of that um, of that editorial eye that you'll have. But uh, but for now, if, if a lot of readers are saying, I had no idea that she was the one that wanted to go off to university. You never said that in the story. And so you need to go back and look at your story and say, like, how did I expect them to know that? What clues did I give right. them? Oh, I see. I only gave it as a one throwaway line on one panel, and it was 40 pages ago. No one's going to remember that, you know. Yeah. And, and so then you have to get better as a storyteller to say, oh, okay, right before she took this action, I needed a page or two before to have reintroduced the idea of her going off to university. And that way people will remember the moment. They'll, they'll have it seated in their head freshly from a, from a page or two ago, and then we're bang, boom. We're off to the races. Yeah, and you can you can seamlessly fit that right in, right? You know, like like in your example, going off to university, you can you can fit that in. The letter comes from the university that says, you know, orientation is in three weeks, and and you you read that orientation letter or something like that. That you can seamlessly fit that right in to reintroduce certain themes and reintroduce ideas. Uh, you, you be be creative about it. You know? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and uh, you can also, to Brad's point, you can have the uncle come in and be like, well, Uncle Steve, oh my gosh, how nice to have you visit. Well, yeah. I, I heard there might be a little change in your future. A change? No, I haven't <laughs> spoken to mom and dad about that. You know, that kind of thing. Oh, but yes, I have been thinking about going to university. And bing, bang, boom, you've, you've reintroduced the storyline through a yeah. wide-eyed newcomer. And there you go. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's part of it, part of it is, uh, as Brad and I always say, you will get better as you do more of it. And if you're finding that readers are having trouble following or keeping up with certain storylines or understanding where you're headed with things, part of it is just the more you write, the better you'll get at that. And there's sort of an editorial... Like, Brad, wouldn't you say that there are two aspects to your writing? There's creative Brad, who wants to write pages and pages and pages. Right. And then there's uh, there's the editor hat Brad that goes, well, now, hold on. We, gotta, we only have room for a couple hundred words on this page. Why don't you slow yep. your roll there, champ? Uh, and, and those two voices fight back and forth. But you get better and better as you go about the intuitive, intuitiveness of letting one or the other one win week to week, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. 
Oh, and, and just to just to backtrack a little bit, also, don't forget, one of the things I actually loved about Marvel Comics, and, and DC picked this up too, the editor's note, right? Somebody would say something, there'd be an asterisk there, and then it would point you down to a little narration box that gave you a real quick explanation, like a, like a one-sentence or two-sentence explanation. I used to love those, right? They were, they were useful. I read them all the time. Right. And they can point you back to previous books or, or a graphic novel or something like this, or just say, you know, this, as you remember, this was, uh, this was Uncle Bob. He's, uh, you know, Nellie's brother, whatever, just to, just to get you back in. So I like the editor's note. And I, I, I wouldn't uh, shy away from doing that either. And my final point on this is if you've been writing for a little while, read your old stuff, like super old stuff. And what, that's I've done that a few times. And just to see, for, number one, as a humorist, all of a sudden you can really tell whether your jokes work or not right. because you forgot the punchline. And you can see if you, if you can actually make yourself laugh, uh, which can be a disheartening uh, exercise indeed. But also what I found out reading my old stuff is I assumed people knew what was going on a lot more than I should have. And, uh, and, and I'm reading along and I'm just like, wait a minute, I'm lost here. And I wrote this shit, <laughs> you know? And that's why I, I've gone to the point where I kind of err on the side of being a little over explanatory because I saw in, in previous books, I've made that mistake time and time again, where I just assume everybody's in that mindset and, and in that headspace and they're not. So I, 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 I've become a proponent of being a little bit over explanatory. Yeah, it's um uh boy, I have a lot of thoughts uh, that sprung to mind when you said read your old stuff. So <laughs> my problem whenever I read my old stuff is that let's say I'm reading a Sheldon and it's only four panels, right? So it's not like I'm I'm reading a, a you know a graphic novel here. Uh, I read the four panels and I go ah so okay the setup on panel one I could have done that better. All right, panel three the exposition too wordy by about fifteen words. I need to trim that down and like you yeah. know right away just with more time and experience uh, to go all right uh, then here's the turn I should have ended on a punch word. I didn't do that. I, I had some sort of follow-up thing that uh, that took the air out of the balloon. That's no good. And I'm tempted to rewrite it. It's like, no, you did this 10 years ago. It's up on your site. Leave it alone. <laughs> Just what are you doing? <laughs> slow, yeah. slow it down over here. Uh, but what's great about that, to Brad's point, is that you see that the tricks that you may have used and the techniques that you may have used 10 years ago might still be being used, wink, if you look carefully, wink, at your work right now, wink. And so right. there's still time to change tomorrow's comic and, and revise it based on what you learned about stuff you did 10 years ago. Yeah. And that goes back to that thing we've said a million times. You know, learning from your mistakes is the most the best kind of learning you can do. The only mistake is the one you don't learn from. And so you go back and you look at that old stuff and you cringe but at the same time, you, 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 if you're pulling something out of it, if you're learning something from it, then tomorrow's comic is going to be that much better. Yeah. I mean, my great takeaway when I read my old stuff is that I was just far too wordy. I was too confident that people were enjoying my my dance of words and wordplay. And, no, I'm being sincere. I'm not, I'm not making no, fun totally of myself. No, I totally get it. I totally get uh, it. And that, and that uh, editing down, editing has really become the, the hallmark for me uh, from years ago, which is that now I just spend way more time going, all right, you've, David, you've got the ideas on the page. Now cut it by 30%. You know, like just bring this down uh and then so i will say one more thing about brad's uh, uh idea and i think it's probably a solid one I'm, I'm trying to think if there's exceptions but the idea that you should err on the side of being over explanatory um for some reason brad my gut wanted to say well hold on i would err on the side of being under explanatory but uh, <laughs> first of all i think brad's right the more i think about it so i'm going to give brad full credit for that as i've been sitting here thinking about it i think brad's i could right. i could tell you didn't agree with me as we were talking oh really could you tell <laughs> that's why i brought it back up <laughs> We are like an old married couple. You just look yeah, over at the I, cocktail party, and I've got my arms crossed, and I'm like, hmm, well, I guess that's Brad's way of thinking I, about it. Hmm. I could tell just by the responses you were giving me that you're like, nah, I don't, I don't quite sign off on this. Well, because I don't want to – It's again, it's a dance. I don't uh, – my thought, my competing thought was I also don't want to treat my readers like they're too dumb because you know how when you're reading a novel and you're like, I get it. You, you, you The person's a murderer. We know that they're going to murder again. You don't need to keep telling me they're a murderer, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, – uh, so that's the competing thought. But then I was also going to say that 
If you do do Brad's method of of being of erring slightly on the side of being overexplanatory, which I think probably has merit, um, allow yourself one or two times in your story to pull an Alfred Hitchcock. And what Alfred Hitchcock would do is every once in a while he would have, frankly, an unexplained moment that never gets explained in one of his movies. Mm. And what it allows you as a reader, or in his case, a viewer, is to self-insert. Oh, you know what? A better example of this is the treasure in um, – oh, God, now I'm forgetting the movie with the killers where they open the box and you never see what's in the box, but it glows on their face. Help me out, Brad. Uh, is seven? No, not seven. Damn you, Brad. I was hoping you'd have the answer for this. Oh, Treasure Island? No, I, Treasure I, Island, for God's sake, no. I, I'm, I'm trying to go with boxes and treasures. That's all I can come no, up no, with. No, no, the movie You're where he talks about the, the, the Royale with cheese. Oh, my God. There's nothing worse than a podcast than oh, two guys oh, trying to remember oh. a movie. Pulp Fiction. What? Pulp, Pulp Fiction, yes. Pulp Fiction, yes. So remember how, uh, and I think I'm right about this, they did actually film what was in that, and it was diamonds, but they intent, intense, uh, 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 intentionally cut that out. So now you only see the glow on their faces, and what yeah. makes that more powerful Powerful as a viewer is you can self-insert some moment that means something to you about what could be in that box that would make them do all these terrible things. So um, allow yourself that kind of Alfred Hitchcock moment maybe once, maybe twice, probably just once in a story that allows the reader to put whatever thoughts, desires, fears uh, that they have into that moment. And sometimes that can make the story more powerful. But for the most part, I think Brad is probably right as much as I'm against it. And maybe a little <laughs> more explanation is probably warranted. That's I, I, that's a good place to leave it. So, Dave, we are at an hour and two minutes. Do we take on another question or do you want to wrap this up? Brad, do we give the people what they want and do some extra comic lab? I say yes, Brad. I say we err on the side of being over-explanatory. <laughs> so here's a question, Brad. This is this is one more fi- one of our $5 Patreon backer questions, uh, and I would love to get your thoughts on this. Um, so how much effort, Brad, do you put into making sure your idea has not been made before? Ah, uh. Man, that's a great question. So here's the full question. They said, there is so much content out there, it is nearly impossible to do this. It is enough to have, is it enough to have your own clear conscience, or should you do some homework with keyword searches to see if you are mining well-trodden material that's already out there? I'm going to tell you truthfully, almost zero. And I'll tell you why I'm going to say that. Uh, because I, I, having been doing comic conventions and appearances and stuff for, for 20 years now, I see so many people atrophied because they're scared to death that somebody's already done their idea. And I always tell them the same thing. It, it, there are no new ideas. People have been walking around creating at this point for thousands of years in, in one form or another. People have been creating. The, 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 the idea that you're going to have a new, original, totally uh, unique concept is a bit uh, much. It, 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 you're giving yourself too much credit. You're not that amazing. No one is. No one. Uh, you might, it, it, sure, you might be the first person to write uh, a story that has like a new piece of technology, but the themes of that, right? You could write a, a, a great story about an iPhone, but somebody wrote the same story about a landline 20 yes, years ago. Yes, great point. Great point. Great point. So I don't, so, so there are, it's so, you know, like the old saying, there's nothing new under the sun Uh, and, and that's a little bit despondent. Sure. I get it. But here's where that opens you up. Uh, I don't put a whole lot of worry into, did somebody do this before? Uh, Here's what I, instead I take that energy and I put it into doing the thing that I'm doing in the most uh, it, 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 I pour as much of what I consider my unique creativity into that project as I possibly can. And if I know I'm putting genuinely stuff that's coming from inside and I'm putting that in there and I'm making it the most Brad Geiger comic that it possibly can be, then I know that even if I've got an idea that somebody else has done, it won't be the same. It, it, they might have a couple of similarities at best, but it's it's going to be my thing. So I don't put a whole lot of worry into did somebody do this. I just put all, all that energy into doing it the way I want to do it, the way I think it should be done, and put so much of me into that 
that it, it's unrecognizable if I do trod on grounds that's already been trotted on. I think, okay, two things. I think all of that is excellent. I think that's a, a great summary of, of that of that viewpoint. And then also, I want to mm-hmm. circle back on the phrase, I want to make this the most Brad Geiger comic I can make it, which I yeah. think is an amazing, I love the idea of you putting your pen down at the end of a work day and go, I did it. I made this the most Brad Geiger comic <laughs> I could make it. And then Brad goes home that night. He has his dinner. He brushes his teeth. He puts on his footy pajamas. He climbs into bed. He goes, I did it, honey. Today I made it the most Brad Geiger comic I can make it. And she gives you a little peck on the cheek, and then you pull the you pull the blankets right up to your chin, holding it onto it with your hands, and you're like, I did it. Good job, Brad. Wiggle myself right into the pillow. <laughs> I don't know. Oh God! It, it it had a pun. It had a ridiculously a ridiculously drawn supervillain in it. Uh, it. It had everything. <laughs> it, it had everything you could want. So I will yes. I will echo with Brad that there's there's that old idea that there's only seven uh, stories in the world, right? That, that you're not going to yeah. to Brad's point of there's nothing new under the sun. You've got the the you know the seven basic ideas are you can overcome the monster. There's the rags to riches. There's the quest. There's the voyage and the return. There's the comedy. There's the tragedy. There's the rebirth. There's all that, right? There's only seven stories and and like to brad's point about the iphone you think you've come up with some amazing iphone story it got done with a telegram 100 years ago it got done with a phone 50 years ago right it's a yeah. it's a version of a story that's come before that being said for an average day-to-day comic here is the pain that i have brad and maybe you have this i've now done four thousand sheldon comic strips over four thousand <laughs> yeah. and so every once in a while I not only get the thought of, oh, God, did I see this comic in, I don't know, Peanuts 30 years ago, and I'm somehow I've, I've uh, thought I've recreated it in my own mind. Uh, so that's a fear of mine because yes. I'm a little forgetful as a person. Another one that I've done, and I've had this happen where it's happened at least four times over those uh, 4,000 strips where I, like, I produce the comic, I put it up on the site, and then I get an email right away going – Hey, you know you did a, a, an exact version of this joke in uh, in 2002, right? And I'll be like, "What? Oh, no, so send me the link." You say that, and then they send me the link, and a shittier version of the joke that I just did was done in 2002. <laughs> and I go, "Oh God, well, I guess I just rewrote the 2002 in my head." We we we. Speaking of of being old men, we've become those old men that repeat our stories all the time. Well, and Brad, we've also become those old men that repeat our stories all the time. <laughs> Dirty. <laughs> so there's that. So on on an average day to day basis, I do my best in my conscience to know that if I, in my heart of hearts, uh, uh, thought that I had written it and done it myself, then that's the best research I can do. Um, if there's ever, a, uh, I will say though, if there's ever an inkling of doubt. Uh, I will put it on hold for a day or two, that I, that particular idea, and say, like, ah, maybe I don't mm-hmm. do this, Sheldon, and I think about if I've seen this one before. Because um, sometimes it's either a version of a version or uh, uh, maybe I did internalize it and think it's my own. And so I'll give it a couple days to make sure that it's an idea that's truly mine, right? So I'll do, I will do that. However, the one that I will do and have done a lot of research on is big projects. And this is before I even start. So before Brad – or not Brad. Before Fred and I started doing Stripped, mm-hmm. the documentary – I said, hold on, this is not a a world that I have been in before. I'm going to spend a week or two, maybe a month, researching every documentary that ever got made about comic strips, just so I make sure that my angle, my thought going into this is unique. Um, And I just wanted to be able to say, no, I'm not doing what they're doing. I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, So I did that. And then with Drive... I had a lot of anxiety that some version of this story – I was like, I'm enjoying this story too much. It must exist somewhere. So I spent a while in the sci-fi world just making sure that um, this version of the story that I wanted to tell was not some rehashing of a 1950s sci-fi story that I had read or something. Um, So I did spend a little time there. And then I remember titles with Drive and with Stripped. I spent an inordinate amount of time making sure that I did not use a title – that was already being used for something else. So I will say I did yeah. a lot of research there. Dave, I wonder if that's because you were less confident I- I doing the movie than it, than you were doing the comic. In other words, I, 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 if you did five more movies, I wonder if you'd put that amount of research into each one of them as you did for your oh, first one. Oh, good point. Maybe not. No, maybe not. You might be right. I, I just wonder about that because it, it, they, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the difference between those two creative endeavors were. 
And the fact that this was your first is the only difference I – or the most significant one in this case that I can point well, to. Well, maybe you're right, and, and maybe that's uh, maybe that's okay, frankly, because you don't want to be jumping into a new genre or a new medium and think you are the most clever person in the world. Because it's like going to a costume party and be like, nobody's going to be dressed up as Bob Ross. I'm going to be amazing at this costume party. And you walk <laughs> in and there's nine Bob Rosses and you're like, well, fuck me. Uh, what, a, what a bad move this was. <laughs> Uh, so you don't want to go into a new genre or a new medium and be like, I'm the best. This is going to be amazing. What? I'm-. Oh, wait. Nine people have already done this before? All right. Well, shoot. <laughs> Walking into a costume party with five Bob Rosses is, is a very unhappy. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot of unhappy trees on that one, Brad. <laughs> yes. Well, so here's, here's – I'm going to wrap this up a little bit just by saying this. Uh, I remember once I had an idea and I knew it was like one of those hack – joke ideas where it was the bat pole except i had batman and robin dancing around it like it was a stripper pole right the bat pole and i remember going on uh twitter and saying certainly someone has had this idea before i'm not even gonna do it and you know it's kind of hacky and it wasn't gonna be for evil ink it was just gonna be for something that I, i i sketched out and put on social media just as something fun to do maybe post it as a bonus to my patreon backers and but I said, I certainly somebody has done this before. And Lar de Souza wrote back and he says, Who cares if somebody's done it before? I want to see how you do it. Ah. And that moment just resonated with me so much where, where it's like, Yeah, you know what? Of course, somebody's done the bat pole before. If I look hard enough, I'm going to find 24 different versions of that theme. Uh, who cares? The point is, how am I going to do it? How am I going to, you know, what, what am I going to bring to that idea? And, uh, and, and Lar, Lar's tweet plays over in my head, uh, I'd say uh, about once every month yeah. or so. Where it's like, who cares? I want to see how you. I, do. I think, yeah, that's that's a great insight to that. You know what? And would want to just to put a button on this. Uh, Many years ago, during a very brief moment in my life, I was an editorial cartoonist at the San Diego Union Tribune, and I think I've told this story before, but this was kind of before the internet. I mean, it existed, but we didn't really jump on the internet all that often. And so every day at the San Diego Union Tribune, uh, the AP wire and the various syndicates would send all the possible editorial cartoons out to every major newspaper in the country, right? And so Mm -hmm. I'd be sitting Mm -hmm. in the editorial room of the newspaper, uh, and my job was to take, one of my jobs as the young cartoonist was to take all of the cartoons off of the wire and bring them to the editor of the editorial page, right? And so I would gather up all the printouts, and on my way to his office, I'd be walking down the hall, and I'd be reading Steve Breen, Steve Kelly, McNelly, all the different, you know, uh, uh, basically every cartoonist that was big at the time. Doug Marlatt, right, exactly. I'd be reading all of them on my way to the editor's office. And here's the thing about human experience that we just have to acknowledge as creators. So all of these cartoonists walked into their desks that morning and read the news, right? And they were all presented with the same basic mm-hmm. 10 or 15 news storylines. And then what happened right. is they each put it into their own personal filter and then also the cultural filter of the wider American experience, right? And like what will readers understand? And here is what I want to communicate to people is that 10 different cartoonists operating in 10 different cities – and remember, this is before the internet a little bit um, – would mm-hmm. send across the wire almost identical comics with the same concept, the same execution, and the same punchline. And I was only, what, 21, 22 at that time? And I would be like, holy shit, how did this happen? These are the same comics yeah. coming from somebody in Atlanta as somebody in <laughs> Portland as somebody in Toronto. How did this happen? And the idea is that you, if you give creative people the same stimulus and ask them to interpret it with the same cultural milieu, then what's going to happen is the same uh, or similar ideas will pop up. So, And that's a version of why Brad said there's nothing new under the sun because in a way we all know the causality of ideas and how they are generated. And so if you give people mm-hmm. similar stimuli, the results will be remarkably similar. And it's not something to be poo-pooed yeah. at. That's just the nature of creativity. Um, and so that happens on a daily basis where if Brad's watching Batman and thinking about a bat pole and some other cartoonist 10 years ago was watching Batman thinking about a bat pole, guess what? They're going to come up with the same idea. You know, it's it's going to happen. Right. So if you just accept it and then you and further accept it, uh, like as Brad and Laura said, that the, the unique way that each one interprets 
interpreted it is in some ways the specialness of it, well, then you, it makes it a little easier to proceed. Yeah. And, 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 and just at, on the very tail end of this, so it's talking to the person listening to our podcast or, or specifically to this question, or, um, so you're worried about what happens when somebody calls you on it, right? They're like, oh, you stole this idea, blah, blah. That's happened to me about eh, a half a dozen times over the course of my career. And I always say the same thing. And, and, and by the way, it's honest and it diffuses it beautifully. I just say, hey, great minds think alike. And it's like if you, if, you, if you say, well, if you start insisting, I never saw that other comic. I don't know who that person is. You, you sound very guilty. <laughs> <laughs> but if you shrug and say, ah. Look at that. That that and and a lot of times I'll I'll admit, you know, not not only do great minds think alike, but that guy did it so much better or or that woman, she executed it so much more uh, wonderfully than I did. I you know, I it, all mine did was remind you how much better hers is. Um if you if you take a little humility, treat it as as something lighthearted and stuff like that. Uh you know, it, you will face much worse things than realizing that your idea is similar to someone else's. And you know what? I I know that we both have said we're going to put a button on it, but your thought just raised another thought in my mind, which is Brad's <laughs> Brad's eternal uh eternal mantra that ideas aren't special, it's the execution of them that are special. And and I think that yeah. plays into this too, which is that the the core idea any cartoonist is going to come up with the with a desert island joke eventually. Uh, you know, e- even if they didn't exist yes. prior, someone would eventually have come up with that, and another one would have come up with it. the The best is the execution of it, and not the idea itself. Is that's what really matters. Um, and then the other thing that I was going to say was I completely forgot, Brad. I completely forgot my second point, which is also that forgetfulness comes into creativity because well, you forget and then you create again. <laughs> the other point is write things down when you think <laughs> of them. Isn't that true? <laughs> Save that for pro tips, <laughs> exactly. Dave. <laughs> well, how about we wrap it up on that note, my friend, that you have a forgetful moron for a friend. No, I have a friend for a forgetful moron. You've been listening to – not going to get a laugh out of that? <laughs> I didn't hurt your feelings, did I? That was just wordplay. I'm sorry. A single tear rolls down my cheek. <laughs> Well, now that I've insulted him, you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been the other... <laughs> no, I'm still crying. You're so good You're... on those bonjuros, but... You yeah, exactly. Your hosts have been Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the cartoonist of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And Dave Kellett, the co-director of Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and Drive at drivecomic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash comic lab. 